So we were afraid of a recession, we were in a recession, the subprime crisis had started to hit, the real estate market was really unpredictable. We projected that in the 2010-11 fiscal year, we would have $117 billion of revenue. Today, the LAO announced that we're going to have about $87 billion of revenue. Okay, so that's a huge difference. That's the kind of changed expectality, expectations that local government has. Now, that's the bad news. The real part of it is that real Californians, real Americans across the country are out of work, and it, the things we're seeing are the consequence of those events, not the consequence of failed policies. However, there are some failed policies we should talk about. There are three aspects of this fiscal crisis from the state and local level that I want us to look at. Uh, the first is, to be realistic, it hurts. Local government is hurting right now. State government is hurting right now. The level of services we can afford to pay for has gone down. There is a real change. And our local government services should reflect that change. Uh, one of the problems that we see in our public finance system is that it's been predicated historically on a growth mentality. What do I mean by a growth mentality? Property taxes are going to go up next year. Sales taxes are going to go up next year. Income taxes are going to go up next year. Not only do we expect it, we depend on it. And therein is part of the problem. We accepted that when we had exceptionally good days, and by good days, I'm talking about one year in California, when state revenues went from, uh, went from six, uh, 60 billion to 72 billion. Now you'd say, wow, that's 20%. That's you can't spend money that fast, right? Well, yeah, we can. Uh, and people would say, maybe we should save for a rainy day. I'm here to tell you the rainy day came, and it's here today. And state, I, I want to point out, California is one example. There are other states, and I won't say these states are more responsible in California. The reality is they hit their crisis before we did. And so they had to respond to issues. Places like New York City, which are suffering, aren't suffering nearly as badly. Why? Well, they went bankrupt a few years ago, and they had to institute restrictive finance measures. Texas, during the 1980s, Many of you may remember the savings and loan crisis. Devastated the state economy. Well, they had to come up with new austerity and responsibility measures as a result of that. So today, I can tell you there are school districts in Texas which despite falling revenues across the board and despite the impact of the economic, conference, uh, of the economic collapse, have not laid off a single teacher. We can't say that in most states, but in California, I mean in Texas, there are districts that that's true. The reason it's true, again, is because they hit the skids before we did. But most states, most localities are facing a, a scenario where the weaknesses of their system, of the public finance system, is being demonstrated. Um, very few places have rainy day funds. There's another aspect of this which goes with this historical perspective that money is always going to grow, which is... Um, you know, the best way to introduce this is, is uh, from an economics perspective. William Baumol is a renowned economist. And when I was in grad school, I had the privilege of reading a paper that talked about the idea that because there was so much productivity in Greece uh, in the good sector, the productivity was constantly increasing at such a dramatic rate, it was pushing wages up in service sector jobs. And that there would come a time, if you took it to the extreme, where because the government is a service sector job, Government competition for salaries would grow so fast that eventually services, and government service in particular, couldn't grow to consume the entire economy. Now most of us, at least I at that time, kind of shook my head and said, well that's an absurd concept. One of the things to understand is that is not how public employees see the world. <coughs> that that is an absurd idea. There is actually a belief amongst government employee groups and amongst many in, a, in elected positions, that in fact, government is there to fund public employment. And that when we have economic crises, the issue is not how do we set priorities and set competing objectives. But it's how do we get through this and continue to fund our obligations. And our obligations are defined as whatever we negotiate. And there's never a do we need to negotiate downward conversation at the front of the conversation at the front of the dialogue. It's always about how do we preserve the growth we've had. Well, those days are changing. 
Um, across the country, we have situations now where local public employee unions are having to face the realities of our current cost structure. Where elected officials are starting to have to come up with the math to make the numbers add up. Now, one of the things that has fostered this and one of the things that we have seen in the midst of all this is that we don't have very good information. One of the things I'm having my students do this semester is actually explore the mechanisms <coughs> of understanding in local city governments. It's a very difficult process. They're very long and tedious documents, and the information is rarely accessible. And yet, these documents are the heart and soul of our public finance system in America. And the fact that nobody knows what's in them, most people can't find them, and that most people don't understand what's written in them even if they do find them, tells us a lot about why there's a disconnect between where our public monies are going and what we're getting for our services. Most of us think, as my friend thought when he lost his job, when bad times hit, we sit down and we do some basic steps. We assess the damage. Okay, how much cash do I have on hand? How much income do I have? And what are the costs that I have to have? If I don't pay electricity, I have a problem. If I don't pay for water, I have a problem. If I don't pay my mortgage, I have a problem. And you sit down and you set your priorities accordingly. You pick your most important activities and you fund those. You drop the dance lessons for the kids. You drop the third car. Right? You start cutting back in the areas that are essential. One of my friends sold his house because he couldn't afford the mortgage payments. Took a huge loss on it but recognize that that's what he needed to do. But you bring your house in order based on your income today. Our public finance system doesn't allow that conversation to happen. If you think about it, that process says we sit down and we look at where we spend all of our money and we set our priorities and we protect the things that are most important. We haven't done that. What we've done is we've said, here's what we wish we had and here's the pieces that we can squeeze today without anybody yelling too loud. Now, do you think my friend's daughter was upset that her dance classes got cut? Sure. Would she scream loudly about it? Well, if you knew her, you'd know, yes, she would. But the choice was made because it was the right thing to do, and the process allowed for that. Our public finance system doesn't have that conversation. In fact, just yesterday, I got on my front porch a letter from the Simi Valley Police Officers Association telling me how evil the city council was. The reason? Because the city council was telling them to not take a pay cut, but to take a pay freeze. Now, I know lots of Californians, I know lots of people across the country who would be happy with a pay freeze instead of the 100% pay cuts that they received. One of the challenges we have is that the public sector's perspective has been so insulated from economic realities for so long that the realities of the people who are paying for the public sector are completely left out of the conversation. <clears throat> the other side of this conversation, and you see this in the LA Unified School District. I don't know if you know, but before the LAO announced today that the state has $21 billion to find, and guess what? We spend a lot on schools, some of it's coming from there. LA Unified has about a half a billion dollar deficit right now that they need to address. And the uh, administration has said, we want you to take four furlough days, which are unpaid days off. So it's a, it's a real pay cut of, you know, four to five percent, maybe more this year. And then a 12 percent pay cut from what you would have had next year. So functionally, it's about, um, it's about a 10 percent pay cut for next year in terms of their dollars today. And the union's response was, no, we want you to cut overhead. Now think about most employment organizations that you're in. Your boss comes and says, look, we're either going to lay people off or we're going to make cuts. And your response is, no, we think you should take a pay cut. Now, I will say that clearly there is lots of opportunity for cutting overhead out of LA Unified School District. Um, that's a whole other separate conversation. But the, the key issue here is the perspective of the employee organizations, and it's the perspective of management. The reality is, part of the reason why management has trouble cutting money out of administration is because they don't know where it goes. The public accounting and reporting systems in public school districts are absolutely horrendous. And I don't just mean that as a, I can't go in as a citizen and find out what's going on. I mean that as a, they don't know what's going on. 
There was a time when you asked Chicago Unified or Chicago Community College.